the power of God, I, I don't know, but there are people God is raising to become mighty vessels. I just saw an anointing rest on you, this role. In the name of Jesus, I don't know where you are, but I pray may that grace now, let it rest upon you and shift you to a new dimension. In the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Christocentric Message. On this channel, you are going to get soul-lifting messages, faith-based content, prayer drills, and videos that would help you grow spiritually. Remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video you are about to watch, and comment on it. Stay blessed. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. It truly is a very great honor for me to be here this morning. I do not take lightly the opportunity to bring the word of the Lord even this morning. And um, let me start this morning by honoring our mother. Mommy, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Truly, truly appreciate. And by extension to our daddy, we pray that the Lord will keep and honor them in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, again, we ask that you will speak to our hearts. The Bible declares that the entrance of your word gives light and even understanding to the simple. We pray that you grant us grace, you grant us wisdom within the time that we have to share. And I pray that our lives and our ministries would never be the same. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you and please be seated. Good morning once again. Our discourse very briefly this morning is along the lines of the theme, making full proof of your ministry. And I've been asked to share along the lines of Philippians 4.13, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. I just want to very quickly lay a foundation with 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. If you, if you have your Bibles here, please turn. 2 Peter chapter 1, particularly verse 10. Apostle Peter was given an instruction that... I believe is very instructive as we explore the principles that make for efficiency even in ministry. Second Peter chapter 1 and for the sake of time I will just read one verse, verse 10, but you may read from verse 2 to 10. But I'll read verse 10. It says, Wherefore the rather brethren Give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. For if ye do these things, he says, ye shall never fall. Give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. Um, the Bible here leaves the believer with a responsibility. The word diligence means to pay attention to invest time, to invest energy. The Bible lets us know that it is our responsibility to make proof of our ministry. Inasmuch as God has called every one of us at various levels uh, for different kinds of ministries. The Bible says, speaking through Apostle Peter, that it is my responsibility and your responsibility to make full proof. That means that you should coordinate together all of the forces that will stop men from disbelieving that you were truly called. It is your responsibility to put together the factors under God that will make ministry work for you. This call and this assignment that the Lord has given us is not one that can be done in the strength of the flesh. All through scripture, the Bible is vocal about the inability of man by himself and in his strength to accomplish God's divine task. We have from Matthew chapter 19 and 26. You may write it down. Matthew 19 and verse 26. Jesus was speaking and he said, With men, this is impossible. 
That means there are some things that are not, they are not available and possible within the realm of men. It is not within the power of a man to change another man in his strength. It is not within the power of a man to bend through the situations and circumstances, the vicissitudes of life, and to thrive and excel and do something that brings glory to the name of the Lord in the strength of the flesh. So very clearly, the Bible lets us know that there are some things that are not possible for men. That means if you see a man producing that level of result, he was assisted by the realm of the spirit. It is not within the power of men to do some things. I think it's very instructive if we understand early because most times, as well-meaning as we are, we attempt to do supernatural things in the strength of the flesh. And then we find out the futility of the flesh again and again and again. It brings us back to a place of nothingness. The Bible says, with men, this is impossible. Matthew 19, 26, it says, but with God, all things. Someone please prophesy to yourself. Say, all things, all things. Are, possible. are possible. Hallelujah. So this is very important. I learned this early in life that there are some things that are not within the power of men to do. A man does not have the ability to lift another man by himself. A man does not have the ability to change and influence another person by himself. God stated through scripture the limitations of men. This is why he made all of the spiritual provisions that empower men who, though ordinary, now begin to walk in realms and dimensions that dumbfound principalities and powers. Are we together? So in as much as we are men, there is a provision in the dealing of God where men are upgraded to realms where we function as gods. This is true. That although we are ordinary and frail in ourselves, there is still a provision in the dealing of God where we can receive strength, we can receive wisdom, empowerment, and all of the spiritual provisions that lift us to the realm that is above the realm of mere men. Psalm 82, when you read from verse 5, the Bible says, They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are out of course. Verse 6 says, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. The tragedy is in the next verse. 7 says, But you shall die like mere men and fall like one of these princes. So I just want to share this morning very briefly for the time allotted me on just one spiritual key that can help ordinary men to rise to supernatural dimensions and to make full proof of ministry. And this one key is the mystery of spiritual empowerment. I like to plead respectfully that we lend our attention to understand this all-surpassing truth, that if you ever find a man, a people, a ministry, excel beyond a threshold level, they were assisted from the realm of the spirit. This is true in the secular. This is true with non-Christians. There is a level of results ordinary men cannot produce. There is a limit. So when you find out that men excel beyond a level, immediately that tells you they have outsourced a system of assistance, whether diabolic or of God. But man on himself, unassisted, cannot go beyond certain levels. Hallelujah. Spiritual empowerment. It is consistent with the character of God as revealed through scripture that he never calls a man and a people and sends them to represent him 
unassisted. Every time from scripture when you read, whether it is Abraham, Moses, Esther, or whoever at all, when God calls people, he makes them and then he sends them. By the way, let me steal out five minutes just to say something that I think has been a burden in my heart for a very, very long time. Our call is not unto ministry. Our call is unto Jesus. This is very important. Every time you find Jesus calling people in scripture, he was not calling them to an assignment. He was calling them to himself. Matthew chapter 4, for instance, and verse 19. Beckoned on his disciples, he said, come, follow me. Come, follow me. Most times, I think the confusion is that we think that the call is a call to ministry, to a church, to a group. And so we focus on the platform uh, and, and, and the, the ministry without knowing the true essence of the call. The believer's call is unto Jesus. There are several things that happens when you meet Jesus. One of it is that he makes you. Come, he says, follow me and I will make you. It is when we are made as a result of that call, then we are sent. Our assignment starts at the instance of our being sent, not being called. Just because a man is called does not mean he has been sent. It's a mistake that very many well-meaning people have made to their detriment. When he calls you, he calls you to himself. Then through that fellowship and intimacy, he makes you, reveals the blueprint of the assignment, then sends you. It is as the instance of sending you, he now empowers you. But just because you are called, you can now send yourself. Your call is genuine, but you were not sent. And there are implications to not be sent by God. Is God helping us? Our calling is unto Jesus, not ministry. I know that sometimes, generically speaking, we say we are called. But now because we are discussing something that especially is among ministers of the gospel. Our call is unto Jesus. It is when we fulfill our calling effectively, then we can do ministry effectively. Empowerment, therefore, happens when we are sent, not when we are called. The empowerment for ministry happens when you are sent, not when you are called. It is possible to be genuinely called, but because you have not stayed to be made, you can live without the requisite level of empowerment that it takes to excel in ministry. And there, there is a plethora of casualties that can happen to an individual that even though genuinely called, was not sent. Are we together? Yes. Luke chapter 10 and verse 1. Please write it down for reference sake. Luke chapter 10 and verse 1. Luke chapter 10 and verse 1. The Bible says... After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them, sent them. Remember once upon a time, he called them. When he called them, it was unto himself. It was a time of mentorship. It was a time of training from the Beatitudes to other events. They witnessed him. They saw him, but he never allowed them to participate in any active. They were students. They were learning. Now when we get to Luke chapter 10 from verse 1, the Bible says, He sent them two by two into every city whither himself would come. He sent them. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. We'll read from verse 1. We'll read from verse 5. And then to 8. Matthew chapter 10, please. Matthew chapter 10. I'll read from verse 1. And when he had called unto him the 12 disciples, the Bible says, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. We go to verse 5 and it reads, the 12 
Jesus sent forth. The 12, Jesus sent forth. He sent and commanded them saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, nor into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. But go rather to the lordship of the house of Israel. And as ye go, now that I have sent you, as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And whilst doing that, you are empowered to heal the sick. You are empowered to cleanse the lepers. You are empowered to raise the dead, to cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. The empowerment is as the instant of being sent. Are we blessed this morning? Praise the name of the Lord. So I presume by the grace of God that many of us have spent time staying with our call, which is Jesus. That relationship that builds intimacy, that relationship that builds knowledge. When he called Moses, remember, Moses was tending his father-in-law's sheep at the backside of the mountain. Then the Bible says that Moses saw a bush that was burning and yet would not be consumed. He said, I will turn aside and see this great sight. And when God saw that he turned aside, he said, Moses, take off your shoes for where thou standest is holy ground. And then he began to reveal himself to Moses. I am that I am. He said, now on the strength of this revelation, I am sending you. Go to Pharaoh. This ordinary rod, it will now become my rod because you've had an encounter with me. Go back to Pharaoh. If Moses left that encounter without that instruction, he would have been surprised what will happen in Egypt. It is risky to send yourself. The mystery is this. Fulfilling our calling takes a long time and sometimes it's embarrassingly hard. God can keep you in one place and those who started with you can go far ahead of you and God says remain there. And sometimes the embarrassment of feeling like your life is not making progress can push us to graduate ourselves from the school of the spirit into a realm where we have not been empowered to function. Staying with God is really the proof of a believer's maturity. Let's talk a bit on spiritual empowerment. Isaiah chapter 61. Theologically speaking, this is known as the messianic prophecy. It was directed to Jesus and then by extension his church because the Bible says we've been grafted into Christ now. So let's look at it very briefly. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, he said, because the Lord hath anointed me. Please mark that word anointed. To be anointed means to be ordained. To be anointed means to legitimize your operations. That means you are no longer functioning in that capacity illegally to legitimize your operation. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed, ordained, commissioned, legitimized me to preach good tidings to the meek. Now please, just, just walk with me briefly as we see the things that the anointing does. It takes the anointing, not just a good sermon to preach. Good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me, there you see the word again. He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, it says, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of prison to them that are bound. He had sent me still with his anointing to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Still with the anointing and still being sent to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, it says, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees or oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. All because of the anointing. There is no believer who can thrive in ministry without spiritual empowerment. As great as Jesus was and is, 
when he came as the carpenter's son, he looked helpless for 30 years until he was empowered. In fact, it will interest you to know that he walked under a closed heaven until his heaven opened. Jesus needed his heaven to be opened. The Bible says, and the heaven was opened over him, and the Spirit of the Lord descended upon him as a dove, resting upon him. And then there was a voice that spoke. He said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And creation was given an instruction, hear ye him. Everywhere Jesus went, they had to listen, because there was a word upon him, hear ye him. When that word comes upon your ministry, it does not matter the location. When that word comes upon your ministry, it does not even matter the kind and the level. Hear ye him is an instruction to creation. That means never ignore this anointing. May that be a prophetic word for someone. In the name of Jesus, the son of the living God. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, not by might nor by power, but it is by my spirit, saith the Lord. I arrived here very late yesterday, and while I was being led to a place where I would pass the night, I, I just kept nodding my head, and once again I was reminded that some things are not possible with men. I could see the excellency of the spiritual empowerment upon this commission upon our father upon our mother and while i went there i was not just preparing a sermon i was praying and saying lord may something come upon my own life now that i am here let me not waste this time doing preacher whatever grace that produced this kind of result that the whole world cannot deny regardless of tribe regardless of whatever it may it come upon my own life listen please sit down there is more to men than all you see. There is a grace from heaven. Empowerment is real. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is real. This side of this country is full of a heritage of the spiritual history of men and women who, although ordinary, encountered empowerment by the Spirit of God and worked wonders. Some of them were not educated in as much as we know education to be. And yet they encountered, this, they encountered this mysterious anointing and it changed their lives. Isaiah 48 and verse 16. The Bible says, and now the Lord and his spirit had sent me. God never sends people alone. The Lord, Isaiah 48 and verse 16. The Lord and his spirit had sent me to the music ministry. The Lord and his spirit to women's ministry. The Lord and his spirit to a prophetic ministry. The Lord and his spirit. We never go alone. It is always the Lord and his spirit. In John chapter 20 and verse 21. John chapter 20 and verse 21, Jesus himself was speaking and he said, as my father had sent me. So Jesus himself was sent. He did not just come, he was sent. He said, as my father had sent me, so send I you. That means we have to examine how the father sent him. The father did not send Jesus empty. He sent him with the spirit. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, it says, with the Holy Ghost and with power. The Bible says he went about doing good, healing all they that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. As my father has sent me, so send I you. You may look ordinary, but there is the backing of heaven. The jealousy of God is invested upon your life. And, and the Bible says jealousy is the rage of a man. That means you want to make a man angry, touch his bride. And if it is true that we are the bride of Christ, the Bible says, regardless gender, this is a spiritual reality. That means I am sure that the jealousy of the one who sent me is behind everything that I do.
spiritual empowerment. It's very, very powerful, especially because of the reality of the times that we live in. If we must excel in ministry, we must contend for superior dimensions of spiritual empowerment. Let me use the time I have left to share just four keys. These are keys that I have seen from scripture. These are keys that I have gleaned from our fathers of faith. Principles that they have walked in and has brought them like ushers into tremendous dimensions of spiritual empowerment. Number one, the first key that controls spiritual empowerment, helping us to make full proof of ministry, is consecration and intimacy with God. Please write it down. The first key that is responsible for such a lavish investment of God's grace and God's anointing. When you find a man that is so lavishly anointed, when you find a woman that is so lavishly empowered by the Spirit, behind that empowerment is consecration and intimacy with God. 1 John chapter 2, please, from verse 15. For the sake of time, again, I'll just quote it very quickly. But write from 15 to 17. 1 John chapter 2, from verse 15 to 17. Apostle Paul, Apostle John now, was teaching us, and he made a very instructive statement. Here's what he said. He said, love not the world. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. He says, if any man, regardless, loves the world, it is proof that the love of the Father is not in him. The word love, not the world, there does not mean to not be blessed. It doesn't mean to sincerely desire good things. It's from the word eros, an ungodly affinity. An affinity, an attachment that can, can kill your relationship with God. Love not the world, he says. Do not develop an ungodly affinity for the world, the system, neither the things that are in the world. That if at any point you find out that your heart is falling away for the things of this life, it is proof that the love of the Father in you is being threatened. And he categorizes this level of lust into three. Number one, he calls it the lust of the eyes. The ungodly affinity that comes to your life by reason of the things you see. These eyes that God gave us has an implication. Because there are things when you see, there are many temptations and many troubles in our lives that came on account of having eyes that see. Is that true? The lust of the eyes. Number two, the lust of the flesh. That this flesh and this body we wear must constantly be, be kept under check because there are appetites. And I'm not just talking of things like fornication and adultery alone. I'm talking of others like gluttony and slumber, sleep. These are things that can erode the power and the grace of God upon the life of a minister. The Bible says a little sleep and a little slumber, a little folding of the eyes and poverty will come upon you like an armed bandit. It takes stamina and it says while shepherds watch their flocks by night. They should be sleeping in the night, but a good shepherd lays down his life. Even by night, they were still watching their flocks. Is God speaking to us? Consecration and intimacy. We must continually pray that God will grant us grace. That the higher we rise in ministry, the purer our hearts towards him and the more detached we are from the blessings that come to us. The temptation is that as God continues to lift us and prosper his work in our lives, chances are that we can become complacent and, and, and focus on these things and not him. I've prayed many times and cried to God that if you will ever give me anything that sustains the ability of taking my focus away from you, and I'm praying it even I'm on, as I'm on the stage here, may it never come to me. It's true. 
money, fame. These things are wonderful, but they have a subtle way of distracting your focus. You must, that's why programs like this and conferences like this are truly powerful because they help us to bring us back to alignment. All of the distractions that have eaten up our focus when we tabernacle for days like this, then it refires our focus once again. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26. Very powerful scripture. It says, my son, even though you are my son, give me thy heart. Not your money, not your offering, not your ministry, not your singing, not your preaching. What I want is your heart. No matter what else you give me, if your heart is far away from me, I'm still searching for something. My son, these are the secrets to the anointing. Authentic, genuine anointing. My son, thank you for your good preaching. Thank you for your, your, your excellent administration. Thank you for your intellectual prowess. But what I require, if it is my anointing you want, is your heart. I've said it that the price for all of God is all of you. All of you is the price. The price for life is death. My son, give me thine heart. Give me your heart. Can we turn this into a prayer in one minute? Lord, I, I, I surrender my entire heart and my life. Not just my parish, not just my church, not just my bank account. My heart. Whatever is in your heart is your God. I hand it over. Please, let, let's take a minute and do a handover service, a handover ceremony. I, I am tired of owning my own life and my own heart. It's brought me a lot of troubles. I hand over my heart to you. When I got born again, I received your life. But now for the sake of the service of the kingdom, receive my heart. My son, give me your heart. Is someone praying? Take my heart. I gave you my church boss. I gave you my church account. Wonderful. I gave you my talent. Wonderful. I gave you part of my fame. But God is saying more than that, I need your heart. I do not trust you until you can trust me with your heart. Hallelujah. Consecration. Consecration and intimacy with God. Let me challenge us respectfully this morning that as a minister of the gospel, if a major part of your life is on stage, you are not doing effective ministry. A major part of your life should be behind the veil. That is really where the fellowship is. And sometimes I know that we live very busy schedules. It's possible to keep doing ministry and keep preaching whereas the wine has finished. In the, the wedding in Cana of Galilee, the feast was still on. And the Bible says, and the wine finished. We must trust God to fan the flames of the secret place again. We must trust God for grace to periodically shut down from activities no matter how great because that's where he found us and that's where those who celebrate us they met us there we must remain there is God speaking to us this morning where fame found you where lifting found you where open doors found you, I pray that you will remain there. Yes, sir. Take the stage, Lord. That's what Nathaniel Bassi sang for us. Have your way. I'm just a vessel. Nothing more. When you're done, 
Please take the glory. I'm satisfied just to see you glorify. You need to strengthen your intimacy with God. Men can clap you to your destruction. Five minutes to your fall, they will still be clapping. And when you fall, they will trample upon you. God is speaking to someone this morning. Return to the secret place. You have held the mic enough. Drop it and leave them there. If they say, where are you going? Tell them, I'm going to where I was before this mic found me. I'm going to where I was before fame found me. Where I was before lifting found me. When you're done, please take the glory. I'm satisfied just to see you glorify. You're all I want. Not ministry. You're all I've ever needed. You're all I want. Shela si bahashalakata. Help me know you are near. More than the accolades of men. You're all. of faith studied the history of the church in Nigeria most of the mighty people who were used did not plan to be in ministry they wanted God so passionately they were not looking for mics and names and fame they wanted him and the power of God met them at the place of their hunger intimacy with God let's hurry up our time is almost up For someone, let me encourage that every spare time of break we have, let it be spent alone with God. Two hours to rest, three hours to rest, just lock yourself and say, Lord, I'm still here again. Let my voice not be strange to the realm of the spirit. Let demons witness me worshiping my king. Let, let, them, let them be part of the testifiers that my secret place has not been left above. Number two, what is the second key that controls unusual dimensions of the anointing? The power of the word of God. Genuine anointing cannot be separated from the word of God. Now, I know that there are all kinds of propositions today that attempt to downplay the word of God. But the Bible says, John 1 verse 3, And without him was not anything made that was made. The word of God makes, it creates. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26, where we read earlier on, he said, My son, give me your heart. First instruction. The second instruction is, let your, he says, and observe my ways. Observe my ways. A very interesting scripture that has blessed me, Habakkuk chapter 3, from verse 3 to 4. If you read this in Amplified, it will bless you. Habakkuk chapter 3, Verse 3 to 4, the verse of emphasis is verse 4. The Bible says in that light, the ray that comes from his hand, that light is the hiding place of his power. The power of God is hidden in his light. That means when the light of God comes, his power is also available there. Genuine anointing is a product of encounter with the word of God. There is the hiding place. You are looking for the power of God is hidden in his word. 
when you feast with the word of God, when you study the word of God, not just to get a sermon. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And I am desperate for you. Thank you. The word of God. I found your word and I did it. It was a joy and a rejoicing to my soul. Please, we must trust God for grace to invest in the word. Invest in the word. I don't know about you. Um, I thank God for the power of technology, but there is something about holding your Bible and sitting down and looking at it. I'm not, I'm, please, I'm not, don't feel insulted. I'm not against, um, you know, electronic devices and all of that, but there is, there is something about making contact with the Word of God, marking something, writing something to remind you. We must obtain grace to invest in the Word. Part of the requirements of a man of God is that we study to show ourselves approved. The Bible says a workman that needs not to be ashamed. It says rightly dividing the word. We must be sound in doctrine. We must be able to communicate truth with power, balance, intelligence, and grace. The third key very quickly. The third key to genuine spiritual empowerment, prayer with fasting. Not just prayer and fasting, prayer with fasting. When you read Matthew chapter 4 from verse 1 and 2, the temptation of Jesus. The Bible says, after the Holy Ghost came upon him, the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness and for a period of 40 days, the Bible says that he fasted and he prayed. Then after being tempted of the devil, I think it's Luke's account, he said, and he returned in the power of the spirit. He returned in the power of the spirit and his fame went abroad. Returned in the power of the spirit. Prayer and fasting has been the age-long key to genuine empowerment and genuine revival. Prayer with fasting. Prayer with fasting. Prayer with fasting. Heartfelt prayer. James chapter 5, when you read from verse 13 to 18. 13 to 18 is the context, but we'll just focus on 16b to 18. Here's what it says, verse 13. It says, is any man afflicted? It says, let him pray. Then when we get to the B part of 16, it says, The fervent and effectual prayer of the righteous availeth much. Then he uses a personality in scripture to show us the excellency of prayer. He says, Elijah was a man of like passion, meaning he was in every way human. Yet he was able to pray that he prayed earnestly that there be no rain for a space of three and a half years. A man single-handedly used prayer to shut the heavens over a territory. And then when the time had elapsed, he prayed again. That means what prayer did yesterday, it can still do again. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. He spake this parable to the end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Then it says there was in a certain city a judge that did not fear God nor regard men. Then in that city, there was a widow, the Bible says, a woman who had lost her system of defense, and she came to him daily and said, avenge me my adversity. And, and for a long time, he would not pay attention to her. The Bible says, but for her continual coming, her importunity, he said, even though I do not fear God and I do not regard men, yet this woman will weary me. That means there is something prayer does. There is something it does to the power of darkness. You may be weak and defenseless, but prayer can give you immunity. It can supply strength. Acts chapter 1 from verse 8. The preceding verses, Jesus was having his last session, final session with the 
120 before he would ascend to heaven. And they said, will you at this time restore the nation of Israel? He said, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has put within his care. Verse 8 says, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, it says, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the utmost part of the earth. Then we go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, now when the day of Pentecost was fully come, that they were gathered together in one accord, suddenly there was a sound like it was in Ezekiel 37. And then the Bible says that they saw the Holy Ghost came and filled them and they received cloven tongues. Now, in chapter 1 verse 8, he never said you will receive tongues. He said the name of whatever comes on you is called power. But in Acts chapter 2, we do not see power, but we see tongues. That means there is a relationship between the prayer language of tongues and spiritual power. He said you will receive power. But in Acts chapter 2, we do not see any power there. But what we see is a language that was given to men. So when you engage in prayer, truly, you become powerful. Show me a weak believer very weak and timid believer show me a ministry a minister without results invest genuine quality time to pray prayer for edification not just supplication edification that you generate energy in the spirit and i show you a believer that will work in tremendous levels of power number four I plead that we pay attention to this fourth key I'm ramping up. This is a very deep mystery. And I'm glad that we're in such a prophetic platform. It's my prayer that we'll maximize this fourth key. The fourth key that controls spiritual empowerment is called impartation. Impartation is a very deep mystery. Is the transference of spiritual possibilities Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 8 the Bible says the Lord sent a word to Jacob but it lighted upon Israel that means every time God wants to transfer a dimension of his grace to a people the way he does it is to find an individual are we together now that everything he does to an individual is for the sake of a people So when God empowered our father daddy Jew and our mother mommy Jew, he had us in mind when that was happening. That when he sends a word to Jacob, it is because he intends for the entire Israel to benefit from it. Impartation is powerful. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 7. Apostle Paul was mentoring the church in Philippi and he said, Ye are all partakers of my grace. That means men can become the partakers of an individual's grace. The grace on a ministry can come on an individual. The grace on a man and a woman of God can come on an individual. Hallelujah. There are many people doing great things for God around the world, around this nation. And you see, the thing about the anointing, the anointing is like an address. You can know where it came from. Impartations are like addresses. You can carry a grace you did not come here with and return back and your results will show immediately. And you see, the thing about impartation is that what is on you is what controls what is around you. I can know what is on you by looking at the results you command around you. Thou anointest my head with oil, but I see what is on my head by looking at my cup. It is my cup. It's not the cup that is anointed. It's my head that is anointed. But I know the result on my head by looking at what happens to my cup. Thou anointed my head with oil. My ministry runs over. Thou anointed my head with oil. My business runs over. So if my cup, my ministry, my business, whatever it is, is not running over, the problem is not the cup. The problem is that there is insufficient oil on your head. At any level in the spirit, there is still room for greater levels of the anointing. Numbers chapter 27, two scriptures will be our last. Numbers 27 from verse 18 to 20. 
Numbers 27 from verse 18 to 20. Moses was instructed to anoint Aaron. I wish it could be projected. Let me rush there so that we'll just read Numbers chapter 27. All right. Verse 18. Here's what it says. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit already. He already had the spirit. He said, notwithstanding. Lay your hands upon him and set him before Eleazar the priest and before the congregation and give him a charge in their sight. May you never forget verse 20. Look what is written there. Verse 20. It says, and thou shalt put some of your honor on him. Honor is, is transferable. Honor is a grace that can lift someone to someone. There is a real grace called honor. No matter how valuable an individual is, if you do not have that grace, you will be despised. The kingdom of God operates by anointings and graces. That means for every dimension of result in the kingdom, there is a grace allocated for it. If it's prosperity, there is a grace allocated. If it's speed, there is a grace. If it's influence and honor, there is a grace allocated. Our assignment is through humility and meekness and discernment to be able to outsource some of these graces that are not in our lives and continue to improve on our results. At every point in our lives, we should be conscious of the graces that are deficient. The Bible says, and God is able to make all grace. That means grace is not just generic, all grace. I can have the grace for wisdom and not have the grace for favor. I can have the grace for wisdom and not have speed in my life. So my assignment is that in a conference like this, I humble myself before God and start asking, Lord, you have done well for me here. In the area of prosperity, you have settled me. But it looks like my life is slow. So you begin to discern. That becomes your prayer request. As words keep coming, you know what you are receiving, the grace for speed. And when it comes, it shows immediately. Elisha followed Elijah. And Elijah said, what are you looking for? He says a double portion. He said, you've asked a hard thing. However, if you can, if you are that focused to see me, to see me means if you discern what I represent beyond my human body. And he said, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And the Bible says that the mantle came on him when he went to Jordan. He said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Several years ago, I was in a Renhard Bonke crusade and I made up my mind that there was a grace upon that man that I desired in my life. I stood there for six hours the first day. Very simple message and I saw marvelous things happen. By the second day, I said, I have to serve this anointing. It's not the issue of man of God now. And when I came, I was, I was serving, doing, they said, no, 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 you are not in any committee. I said, committee or no committee? I came here with hunger to receive. When you are desperate to receive, you drop everything aside and pursue sincerely. I stood there for six hours. I humorously would say that there was a pregnant woman close to me. And because of her pregnancy, I don't know what brought her to that crusade ground. Occasionally, she would lean on me and at a point I said, Madam, we are all standing here too. We are tired, you know. And then... Here's the encounter. He preached a simple message that night. And he was about to take a cup of water so that he would minister the baptism. That was the first time my eyes were opened to see the, the visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I saw a big bird, as big as this auditorium, hovering around the entire crusade ground. I thought everybody was seeing it. It had silvery silvery linings like this just not flapping the wings and the spirit of god took me to genesis chapter 1 from verse 1 and 2 and the spirit hovered round 
the face of the waters. And the Holy Ghost told me that the union between the spoken word and the movement of the spirit is what produces miracles. When I came back to myself, I was back in the stage. I said, thank you, Jesus. I know that I've received this. Impartations are real. You can obtain a grace. Hallelujah. One time I had the opportunity of sneaking into the redemption camp here and I had the honor and the privilege of being taken to the prayer room of our father. When I lay down there, I cried, I prayed, I said, Lord, there is one thing. You have a covenant of answered prayer. May that grace and that impartation rest upon my life. Why will one person say, may God bless you and your life changes? And someone will say it hundred times before the same thing happens. And yet the Bible says the same Lord is rich unto all. I, I, my prayer in this morning devotion is that someone would discern. Impartation cannot happen until there is discernment. Discernment away from what you already have. Look to that which is not yet there. Impartation. I truly believe in the transference of the anointing. One last story and then we'll pray. Many years ago, I was in Joss. And then I went to buy sugar cane. And I saw a group of mothers. I have profound respect for women, especially mothers. And I said, no, 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 mommy, please. I'm your son. Would you allow me to pay for it? It was not more than 100 naira. And they said, no. They were struggling to remove money from their, you know, this thing they tie here. And I said, please let me do it. Give me the honor. And they were watching me. I paid for that sugar cane and, you know, paid for them too. And the women started blessing me. For some reason, I don't know why I did not pay attention to what they said. But then one of them looked at me strangely and said, My son, forever walk upon gold. I knew that woman was not an ordinary woman. It was on the way here, going to Ekiti. I stopped at a little village. Now, I don't know the names of your places here, forgive me. I remember stopping there. I saw that people within these regions lived strangely and mysteriously long. I said, I need the grace for long life because I know the kind of call God has given me. And I know the attacks. I remember, and now I, I don't speak Yoruba. Maybe just a, a bit of it. And then we finally found someone who could interpret the English for us. I said, please, where is the oldest man in this place? I went to preach in Ekiti on my way back. And then they took us to an old man. And we said, please, I'm a man of God. We just came to honor your grace and that you speak whatever has kept you long. I went to a place and I saw 130 something. He just died. I said, please, where is the wife of this man? Is she still alive? Because two have become one. Anyway, that man prayed and released that grace. Do you know when we met him and they explained to him, I thought the man would say, no, 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 no. All grace has just come from God. He laughed. He said, kneel down. He began to pray for me in Yoruba. Honestly, I, I wasn't even interested in what he was saying. I just felt like a crown. True story was put on my head. When he was done, we sowed into his life. I was on my way to go and enter the vehicle and someone called my attention and said, this man that died 136, that's his wife standing there. I could not believe it. That woman was like a hundred and something, yet she was standing. And I, I said, can they take me back? I said, ma, I don't know what to call you now, but please, can you pray for me? And the woman tapped me. We entered the room and she was showing me the pictures of her husband. That was the husband of her youth. They were together from very early, black and white photos, and she showed me around. And I said they should help tell her that, please, I don't know if I'll call myself your grandson or your great-grandson, but mama, please, let me not live here like this. Do you know what she did? She said they should tell me to kneel down. She took off both of her shoes and stood on barefoot. Now, I don't know what that means here, 
But that woman, she stood on her feet and more than 15 minutes, she was raining prophecy upon my life. People don't rise by mistake. There are mysterious anointings that lift people. We are wrapping up. My time is up, but we are going to pray. Anybody you see excelling beyond a certain level, there are mysterious graces. There are always stories. And most times these stories are not said because we want Jesus to be glorified. But there are stories behind the rising of people, behind the mysterious lifting of people. Was it not Samuel that called Saul and said, come up? He said, is it not because the Lord has anointed you to be captain over his people? Someone is going to pray. That all of the vessels that stand here to minister, especially our mother in the Lord, Beyond what she's saying, there are graces, testaments of sacrifice, years of pain and covenants with God. Father, I've been coming for Feast of Esther, but it will not be like before again. Something must come upon my life. Just two minutes for us to cry. I don't know how you are going to cry before God here. But please remember your ministry. Remember your children. Remember those connected to your grace. In the next two minutes, just play something for us. Everyone cry before the God of heaven. Change my life. Change my ministry. Lord, I have seen your mercy, but I need speed. I need helpers, financiers to arise for me. This is a prophetic platform that you have so honored. You have so glorified globally. What grace have you invested on this ground? What grace have you invested upon our parents? Let it come upon my life. Let it come upon my ministry. What is it that you gave them that makes that every time they call you here, Somebody is praying. Somebody is praying. Lord, where is the grace for honor that you have given in this ministry? Where is the grace for speed? Where is the grace for favor? The Esther anointing that calls help us mysteriously. Where is the grace for relevance and continuity? There are people who start 10 years, they have gone down. Five years, they have gone down. What is this grace that has sustained this ministry this long? I open up my heart to receive. Just two minutes and we're done. I have found my servant David. And with my holy oil have I anointed him. Please pray. The grace for consecration. And intimacy with the Holy Spirit. The grace for the word of God. The grace for prayer with fasting and the discernment to open up for impartation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In one minute, listen, we're still praying. In one minute, Every grace that you have discerned upon our mother and by extension our father that the Lord has revealed to you. Can you mention it by name and say, Lord, by your mercy I receive. By your mercy. By your mercy. By your mercy. Feast of Esther, let it be a time of impartation. Graces are transferable. They are transferable under the atmosphere of humility and meekness and genuine hunger. Pray to God. Lord, I honor this grace. I honor the graces upon this ground. Are you praying? Let it be from the depth of your heart.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, faithful Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Father, we thank you for your word. Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. Do not keep the video to yourself. Share to as many as you can to help them bless. Check our homepage for more of our messages. Subscribe to the channel. Comment on it. Like it. See you on our next video. Bye. Pray. Pray. Pray for your destiny. The phase of development. Lord, grant me the discipline.